Don't forget to tweet, hashtag AWE2016. I'm seeing some awesome Twitter chat out there. Dan Eisenhart is the co-founder of Smart Eyewear Pioneer Recon Instruments. An entrepreneur with a passion for sports and wearable technology, Dan brought the first consumer heads-up display to market in 2010, and in 2015, Recon Instruments was acquired by Intel. Today, as general manager in Intel's new devices group, Dan continues to lead the Recon team and to play a pivotal role in the evolution of wearable technology. Here to talk on the Butterfly Dream Smart Eyewear in 2031, please join me in welcoming Dan Eisenhart to the stage. In 2031, the world is going to be a very different place. One in every six cars is going to be self-driving. 500 billion things are going to be connected to the internet. That's according to Cisco. And augmented reality won't just be a fact of life. For a lot of us, it's going to be kind of a necessity. And it's going to look a lot like this. Smart eyewear that's so small and so lightweight that it looks just like a regular pair of glasses. And it's going to do some amazing things for us. It's going to really empower us. And we're going to use it for everything. We're going to wear it all day, every day. And leaving home without it is going to be like leaving home without your smartphone today. Now, before I move on, let me touch on something. I know this is a very friendly crowd, but there's still a lot of people out there who don't buy into this whole smart eyewear thing. They don't really think it's going to succeed. I mean, are, really, are, are people really going to wear a device on their face all day? And we all remember how the early adopters were called glass holes. But here's the thing. When new technology comes out, and in order to use it, you have to change your physical appearance a little bit, there's bound to be some pushback. So the reactions we're seeing are not that surprising. But that doesn't mean that technology won't succeed. Quite the contrary. So let me ask you, how many people here in this room today are wearing a wristwatch or a smartwatch or any kind of wrist-worn timepiece? Hand up. I'm wearing one. If you were a male 100 years ago, you wouldn't have dreamed of wearing a wristwatch. In fact, you would have been mortified just thinking about it. Here's a newspaper clipping from 1916. Sissyism is in the discard at Harvard, and the wristwatch must vanish. This is the edict of the student body, and a vigorous crusade is underway to have the objectionable emblem of effeminacy put out of commission for the time being. So 100 years ago, wristwatches were women's jewelry. They've been around for a very long time, and they work, worked really well. But if you were a man and you wore a wristwatch, you were ridiculed. Instead, you were supposed to carry these things around. This is a pocket watch. And this is about as heavy as my smartphone. So how come you're not wearing a pocket watch today? Well, in 1917, US went to war in Europe. Americans were fighting in the trenches in France and Belgium, and they quickly realized that a pocket watch was not very convenient. It was actually no good. It's too heavy, it's too bulky, it's too easy to drop. And you can't really tell the time and use a rifle at the same time. So it's just a mess. So we started seeing trench watches. And trench watches were these wrist watches, really, with canvas straps and metal covers. Uh, officers started using them first, then soldiers did. And soon enough, the wristwatch became a standard piece of military hardware. In 1918, the war ended. All these officers, all these soldiers, they came back and they brought their wristwatches with them. They started using them at home. They started using them at, wa at work, just walking down the street. Did you have people walk up to them and go, hey, sissy, nice wristwatch? No, of course not. These guys had just won the war. They were heroes. 
So in a pretty short amount of time, our preconceptions about the wristwatch got flipped upside down. The wristwatch stopped being just for women, and it became an object of desire for men. So by the 1940s, the president was wearing a wristwatch. FDR had one, Harry Truman had one. So if you look at history, it's pretty clear. If a product is useful enough, if it's valuable enough, if the benefits are real and the downsides are subjective, then people's preconceptions get swept aside pretty quickly. The momentum is just too strong. That's what happened to the wristwatch. And I believe that's what's going to happen with smart eyewear. So in 2031, the question isn't going to be, should I buy smart eyewear? The question is going to be, should I upgrade my smart eyewear this year or next year? That's going to be the new reality. Because living without smart eyewear is going to be very, very inconvenient. Last year, 15 billion things were connected to the internet. In 2031, 500 billion things are going to be connected to the internet. Just about anything that can be made better by some silicon and a connection to the internet is going to have them. And the amount of data coming your way is going to be staggering. When you're out shopping, when you're at the gym, when you're walking down the street, data is going to, is going to come at you from everywhere. So, are we going to use our smartphones to access this information? No. We're already reaching into our pockets 100 times a day or more. We'd be glued to the screen. We'd be walking around like this. What about smartwatches? Well, they can help. They're a stepping stone. But smart eyewear can obviously do so much more. So in 2031, smart eyewear, again, looking like this, is going to be able to recognize objects around us. It's going to be able to annotate things in your visual field. So when you're out buying clothes, you won't have to look for the price tag to find out what something costs. If you're at the restaurant, you'll know exactly how many calories you have to burn off the next day at the gym. And if you hear something in another language, you'll know what it means instantly in English. And that's just half of it. In 2031, smart eyewear is going to know you. It's going to track your alertness, your eye movements, your heart rate, your stress levels. So it knows exactly what information you need and when you need it. If you're in a meeting with your boss, it'll know that you don't want to be disturbed. When you walk to the next meeting, it'll update you on all your notifications. And if you get the wrong information at the wrong time and you get annoyed, well, guess what? It'll know that too. And it'll go, hey, that didn't go down so well. Let's not do that again. And it's all going to be totally seamless. And it's going to set us free. Because with a smartphone or a smartwatch or a laptop, information is always locked away somewhere in a little rectangle. And you have to make a choice. Do I look at the screen or do I look at the world around me? Because with a screen, you're taken away from what you're doing, from where you are, from the people you're with. And to access that information, well, it's an active process. You have to look for it. You have to curate it. You have to do all the work. With Smart Eyewear, there is no work. You don't have to filter out useless stuff. You don't have to waste time or energy looking for things, curating things. Everything is curated for you automatically based on your context. So that's what I mean. In 2031, if you're still stuck with a smartphone, then that's going to be seriously inconvenient, and you're going to be way more distracted. In fact, it's going to be a huge waste of your time. So that's going to be the end of the smartphone as we know it. And not only that, any information you need, you can have right there in front of you. Even to watch a football game with your friends, you'll throw up a virtual TV in your living room, you'll share it with your friends, so everyone can see that floating right there in front of them through their own smart eyewear. Smart eyewear. So you're not going to need any screens anymore. And that's going to be the end of the screen, because the world 
will be your screen. You'll be able to see anything you want anywhere. And you, it's yours to shape or reshape or transform pretty much however you want. And somebody's probably going to make a plugin that makes you put funny clothes on animals. And that's going to take us somewhere really interesting. There's this story by a well-known Chinese philosopher called Shuang Tzu. He lived about the same time as, uh, around the same time as Aristotle. And the story goes like this. Once upon a time, I had a dream. In the dream, I was a butterfly. I was flying around, enjoying myself completely carefree. And then I woke up. And because the dream had been so real, I had to wonder, am I a man who just dreamed that he was a butterfly? Or am I a butterfly now dreaming that he is a man? Now, there's quite a few ways to interpret this story, but one of them is that reality is subjective. Reality is what we perceive it to be. So what you think of as the world outside your skin, the room we're in right now, the chair you're sitting in, that's really your brain taking all these input from your body from your eyes, from your ears, from the surface of your skin, and processing those inputs and putting together a picture for you. But that picture only exists up here. The whole world around us is really, the way we perceive the whole world around us is really some very clever signal processing happening inside our cerebrum. So without thinking about it, we all take this huge leap of faith every day. We assume that the picture in our brain matches what's out there. We assume there's a, there actually is something out there. And we, of course, assume that everybody else has the same picture in their brain. We assume we all have a common frame of reference. Without thinking about it, right now you're thinking the person sitting next to you is seeing the same thing that you're seeing. And that's probably a pretty good as assumption. Most people's bodies work pretty much the same way. We all process input pretty much, pretty much the same way. But now let's turn the clocks forward 15 years. In 2031, a lot of us are going to wear these things, the smart eyewear, because there's too much data out there for our phones to handle. And we wear these devices to transform, to augment what goes into our eyes which is the most important input our brain gets from the outside world. But now suddenly there's no guarantee that the person sitting next to you is seeing the same thing you're seeing. The detail is going to be different. The basic elements might be the same, but the detail is going to be different. They might have a piece of information overlaid that you don't have. They might have a virtual screen floating somewhere that you don't have. Maybe they're using that plugin with the animal clothes. So even, what's, even though what's out there is exactly the same, the picture in your brain and in that person's brain are going to be different. Their experience of reality is going to be different from your experience of reality. You're going to live in different worlds. If some of you are having trouble imagining that, imagine this, your phone just broke but you have to look up directions for where you're going to go for lunch later on. So you ask for the phone uh, from the person sitting next to you. And that's going to be a little jarring, right? I mean, uh, once you get over the social awkwardness, the experience of actually using somebody else's phone is going to be weird because their home screen is different from your home screen. They don't have the same apps that you use. And if they're on a different OS, none of the shortcuts or menu options are the same, the keyboard might not be the same. So you and that person both have this thing called a phone, and it's doing pretty much the same thing for you, but your experience of that phone is different from what that person is experiencing. Now, let's assume you're not talking about a five-inch screen. Let's assume we're talking about your entire perception of the world around you. In 2031, that's going to be the reality. Not only are we going to wear different smart eyewear from different manufacturers, each experience is going to be so personal, so individualized, that we're going to have 
hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of people, each experiencing a different version of the world. For us in the tech industry, for those of us who actually build these products, that's going to make things really challenging. And we have a huge responsibility to, that we do, to do things right. We have to make sure that we don't get stuck in the old ways of thinking. That we don't just look at things from the technology perspective. Because if we do that, we're not going to do our jobs right. And the risk is that we're going to drive people apart when te technology can do so much to bring us together. To avoid that, we're going to have to start asking ourselves new questions. We're going to have to infuse these products and these experiences with a deep understanding of our humanity, of history, of anthropology, of philosophy. We'll have to make sure that in every cultural context, in every part of the world, we do things right. As an industry, we have to make sure that if people live in different realities, then those realities are compatible, and that the technology, that the technology really does bring the people together. And the right way to start down that path, well, that's to, have, that's to have more conversations like this one. And to never be afraid of thinking a little too big or of being a little too far out. Because I can see the future, and it's a pretty far out place. Thank you. <laughs>